thank you for inviting me and we'll discuss what my lab has been doing in the last 12 or 18 months working on bees. So as Alison said, we work labs, agriculture biosolutions. We aim to solve solutions for the producers and move those solutions from our bench into the barn because I also work on lots of different livestock as shown by this. So major focus is in trying to develop point of care diagnostics to allow early detection. And everyone would be familiar with rat tests because we've always had to shove our swab up their nose and mix it around and put it into a plastic cassette. And I will talk about that technology we've um, moved on. I won't talk too much about understanding disease, but that gets back to understanding the biology and how we can use that to um, interfere with the, the life cycle. And one of the things which is ongoing in our lab at the moment, we're working with the abalone um, farmers down towards Port Ferry, and you're wondering how abalone and bees are related. Bees use a, a immune system we call transgenerational immune primary. And abalone, we're trying to do the similar thing with abalone and, and use a virus mimic to vaccinate abalone. Now, those who may know about American Felbrood, there's a vaccine um, released into the US market by Dallin Health. And um, the underlying biology is this TGIP. And um, actually, we just got a grant from Ag Futures to develop an American Felbrood vaccine. Um, that work won't start until spring. So another 12 months, I can give you an update. So we will start that work within 12 months. So. We need to, you know, get the colonies up and running and, and queens before we start doing our testing. So, as mentioned before, bee health is a complex issue. You know, there's a lots of different weather. All beekeepers do things slightly different. We have our major pest diseases, and then we have genetics that we saw, nutrition, and or agronomic practices that will have an effect on that. So all these events can cause major colony losses. If everything's nice and happy, bees will carry pathogens quite happily along until they hit a stress event. And so what we'll talk about today is what we're doing, diagnostic surveillance of honeybee pathogens. I have a, an interest in nutritional immunology because if we can keep bees happy, healthy and happy, we won't have an issue with pathogens. And then we're talking about um, vaccine work, which I won't mention. So in Australia, there's about just under 50,000 registered beekeepers around the country. And when I've started working on these diagnostics for American European Farm Brew, the first question is I get asked is how prevalent is that disease and should we worry about it? Um, I didn't have an answer to that question, so I set about trying to answer it um, using surveillance. And so what we took as our surveillance tool is the end product of beekeeping, it's honey, which is an easy sample we can collect and it's easy to transport back to the lab from around Australia. And inside that honey, because the bees interact with the environment and pathogens, the little pieces of DNA are transferred into that honey, what we call environmental DNA. And so that DNA we can extract from that honey. The honey also presents a very good stable matrix but, and preserves that DNA within that. And so if you collected honey over a period of time, it would give you like a, a record of what that colony is having in pathogens. It also gives us a hive or apiary level um, view of the disease, not at an individual level, what's happening in bees, but overall um, diversity of pathogens. So we've collected 134 samples around Australia and we've extracted 111 of those and we've so far tested 104. So we're just tidying off the last of those tests now. 
So we've started looking at the usual suspects of disease, which lots of people would know. So we've got our bacterial diseases, American fowl brood and European fowl brood. Our two pests, arthropod pests, great wax moth and small hive beetle, and our more fungal nosema and our chalk brood diseases. And so we use um, molecular technology, um, what we call uh, quantitative PCR or conventional PCR. And so this is just a molecular technique where it allows us to amplify up the DNA um, into a large amount so we can actually see that uh, presence of that DNA in samples. And so this is prevalence of all our samples from our fungal. So we've focused on Nasima and our um, chalk brood function, and this is what the cement on the other side. It's a little microsporidium parasite, sits in the digestive system and causes um, problems in that digestive system over winter. So on our axis here is on our Y is the percentage of samples what were tested positive. And you can see in Victoria, of the samples we tested, 60% of them had the cement serenii, and, a, and very little, and a tiny bit of chalk brood. Um, but chalk brood is a lot more prevalent down in Tassie, and it may be due to the weather conditions being more favourable for that fungal disease to, to um, maintain down there. And you can also see that that fungal chalk brood is not very prevalent in Queensland. We never tested it at all. So they, you can see climatic changes potentially have effect on what diseases you find throughout Australia. So our next um, two is our favourite bacterial diseases. We have an American fowl brood, which is caused by penicillin larvae at the top, and European fowl brood, which is caused by um, Nislococcus plutonis. You can see we, there's a, it's actually quite high. We have about 30% prevalence of American fowl brood running through Victoria. So it would be one disease that we should be always on the lookout for. And you can see in uh, West Australia, they have uh, about just under 15% of an American fowl brood. More importantly, though, is they've never been a reported case of European fowl brood in WA. And that's, they have biosecurity, and that's why you can't bring in honey and other equipment into WA. And so far, that looks correct. The biosecurity measures are working. There's never been. We, in our assay, we can't detect that um, European fowl brood in WA. And so, which is quite, shows that the biosecurity is uh, working in that. And it's interesting that we've never seen any other American fowl brood in South Australia um, saw a large increase in European fowl brood. So, and, and so it's an interesting to see the epidemiology of those diseases and what practices are getting occurring in those states. If we look closely at this frame and these two, they are very similar, and so to the unexperienced Versus sometimes it's quite like me, I'm not very experienced identifying these two diseases. Um, they could look very similar. So we set out about trying to develop an assay at a molecular level uh, for two reasons. One, to allow easy identification between American fowl brood and European fowl brood, but also as a management tool. And so the correct management option in real time allows us to do um, various techniques, which then um, determines which management tool we do. So we have our little hive, we, we suspect it's infected with a, a disease. We test it, if it's European fowl brood, we can get antibiotics, treat that, clean it up. If it's American fowl brood, we then have to um, ultimately destroy that hive and those colonies. But there's a as Nikki said, there's an integrated management techniques. And in, uh, for American fowl brood out of um, Sweden, they've been looking at trying to integrate 
uh, technology in that. So they take their hive, they test for American fowl brood. If it's all negative, it can come out of the apiary into pollination, honey production, and end up with um, honey. Now, if it's tested positive, they quarantine it, shake off the bees into a new hive, and retest those. And that's repeated until they get the levels down below their testing. So over, whoops, over a five-year period, they went from highs harboring from 74% um, spores down to 5% through this technology. And, and, and the spore counts uh, were only found really low in those highs. And the success was based on subclinical detection. And what I mean by subclinical is that there's no disease present. You can actually visually see or test for. And so if we can introduce a subclinical test, we can actually start to move towards um, lowering that prevalence of the American fowl group. So we take in a technology, which has got a very long name, it's called loop mediated isothermal amplification. We call it LAMP for short. Um, a PhD student in the laboratory, um, Danny Ackley, um, developed these tests. And why we chose this technology for is because it's actually quite rapid and it's very cheap and portable. So you can do this in the field. So in the bottom here, this is what we call the cycling for PCR. So PCR is just amplifies DNA. At DNA, we go up and down temperature gradients to generate large amounts of DNA at the end we can test. Now, LAMP does that as well, amplifies small bits of DNA into large amounts, except it just does one temperature. And so that simplifies the whole process and allows us to move it out and be portable. And so, First thing we wanted to do is to actually show what our limited detection. So how sensitive is our assay? So simply we take, um, we had genomic DNA from an isolate we grew in the lab. We just took that unknown concentration and did tenfold serial dilutions and see yeah, how we um, detect it. So the readout on that machine before shows, um, recognizes DNA by fluorescence and anything uh, which is, is, appears before 20 minutes is positive. So I can't see, we 20 minutes on it. But you can see these are all positive. In the table, we can start from five nanograms, we get down to 10 to the eight nanograms per microliter. So that's in, in spore level, that's down to about five spores in, in per reaction. We can do that in 12 minutes. So it's actually quite sensitive, hitting it. Secondly, we also got to make sure it's specific to the disease or the bacteria we want, not something else we find in the environment. These are a general range of panel of bacteria we have in the laboratory, which are found in the environment. And we extracted DNA and tested all those to make sure there was no cross reactions. These two red lines are the positive. So this is P larvae and it should detect, which it does, but all the other ones, there was nothing. So showing the assay is actually quite specific. So this is all good and well. We can do all this in the lab. Can we do this in the field? And so we developed uh, a, a field sampling assay where we take a bee, we shove the little bee into a solution with some ball bearings, we shake that up by hand. Um, that DNA, that busts up the bee and then it releases DNA. We can take an, an aliquot of that um, material and put it in our machine and then um, run it and see if we can do that. So we took it out to the field and we tested, uh, we had 62 positive AFB samples. We um, was able to test out in the field. We then correlated that 
in laboratory with our other gold standard test, which is um, a PCR test we use to verify the assay, picks up zero. And then, um, and but we had one negative out of the um, lamp assay. So we ended up with a, a sensitivity of 97% in the field, which is uh, quite good. So on, we did the same thing for the European fowl group. You see the assay in the positives, your um, European fowl fruit was, we got detected 43, but we also had some false negatives, we have 14. So the sensitivity for that sits at around about 80%, which is not, which is still quite good um, compared to um, yeah, current technology testing. And so um, just to sort of conclusions, we've got this field-based assay, which can detect subclinical infections. Um, we're working on trying to move that into a, a commercial system. It's quite sensitive. Um, and we've optimised the extraction procedures to use it in the field. And so I'd just like to thank uh, Danny, who did all the work on the uh, lamp assays. Uh, Gopika, whoops, right. Uh, Gopika, um, that's uh, another PhD. She's done all the honey prevalence testing and other members in the lab have contributed to that. Some of this work was funded by Ag Futures Australia through the honey pollination program. Thank you.